Hello, welcome to the Authors Hour. My name is Fred Zerm, and I represent the Friends of the Chautauqua Writers Center. We are a volunteer organization whose mission is to support and supplement the work of the institution's Writers Center. We sponsor a number of events aimed at encouraging writers and writing at Chautauqua and beyond. Our weekly activities include open mic on Zoom at five o'clock on Sundays and this author's hour reading series at 1215 on Thursdays. Also, as you should know, on Zoom. Two special events are also rapidly approaching now that we're into the month of July, well into it. If you have a favorite poem you would like to read as part of the annual Robert Pinsky Favorite Poem Project, and then briefly explain why it means so much to you, you have through July 14th to apply for this event. The readings themselves will take place at five o'clock on Wednesday, July 21st on Zoom. The annual literary arts contests for writers of all ages are now open for a submission with cash prizes for the winners. Submissions are open through July 25th. The award ceremony will be at 2.30 on Sunday, August 8th on Zoom. You can find out more information, relevant applications and Zoom links on our webpage at www.chq.org slash FCWC. I'll post that link in chat in a while. When you're on that web page, please consider joining the Friends to help support writers, writing, and the Writers' Center at Chautauqua. I will have a few announcements later at halftime but let's get to the readings. We begin with Patricia Averbach, her debut novel, Painting Bridges, published by Bottom Dog Press in 2013, was praised by Michelle Ross, book critic for the Cleveland Plain Dealer as an, quote, an introspective, intelligent and moving novel, end of quote. And I would concur. Her second work of fiction, Resurrecting Rain, was released by Golden Antelope Press in December 2019. It won a silver prize as, uh, in the Royal Palm Literary Awards from the Florida Writing Association as an unpublished manuscript and was semi-finalist for a Tucson Festival of Books Literary Award. Uh, in addition, it was a finalist for Chanticleer's Somerset Award for Contemporary Fiction. She's also a poet and her poetry chapbook, Missing Persons, won the London-based Lumen Camden Prize and was cited by the Times of London Literary Supplement as one of the best small collections of the year. So she has an international reputation. Um, her novel, Duplicity, is now finished and soon to be published, right? Without, oh, I do just a personal note, she divides her time between Shaker Heights, Ohio, Sarasota, Florida, and Chautauqua, New York. She served as director of the Chautauqua Writers Center for several years and is certainly still an active member of the Chautauqua writing community. One place to get her book, by the way, is on Amazon. And if you put in Patricia Ababach, her works should come up. So, Pat, take it away. Thank you, Fred. And another place to get the book is at the Chautauqua Bookstore. So if you're on the grounds, please look for my book at the bookstore for all of our uh, Chautauqua writers' books. Uh, the bookstore has been very supportive. Um, my uh, second novel, Resurrecting Rain, uh, is uh, the story of a middle-aged librarian who was born and raised on a hippie commune 
in the uh, 70s. And uh, she's someone who uh, was not cut out for, for hippie life. And when she was only 14 years old, she ran away to live with her Orthodox Jewish grandmother. Um, the grandmother was very happy to welcome her, but on condition that she sit Shiva, that is to go through the process of mourning uh, for her mother as though her mother were dead. Uh, and she has had to live her life as, uh, as though her mother had died. And that has left a, a real hole in her life that uh, she, she needs to reconcile. Uh, however, she went on to, to create a, a very middle-class life, just what she wanted, until a series of disasters tore that life out from under her. And she lost her house, uh, her husband, uh, at least the marriage is in, in grave jeopardy. Her kids aren't speaking to her. And she's facing homelessness now um, on the streets of Sarasota. Uh, I'm going to read a section uh, where she is right on the verge of uh, being on the street and desperate to find a place to live. Um, all she needed was a room, a clean bed, and a hot shower. That would feel like luxury. Dina's mind wandered back to her house in Shaker Heights, the brick Georgian shaded by honey locusts, maples, and a lone elm miraculously resistant to Dutch elm disease. She pictured the late afternoon sun playing over the hardwood floors, the Tabriz carpet in the living room, muffling the sound of the mantel clock ticking over the marble fireplace, the small creaks and groans of an old house settling. It had been lonely in its way, but it had also been oppressive. Why had she needed so much? Why hadn't she listened when her mother quoted some rabbi who'd said, who is a wealthy man? He who is happy with what he has. Dina got up and found a bottle of ibuprofen in the medicine cabinet, washed the tablets down with a swig of water, then poured herself a glass of Chardonnay from a bottle Andor had left in the fridge. Her head was pounding and the muscles in her neck and shoulders were in spasm. She sipped the wine, made a sour face, then poured the vinegary liquid down the drain before returning to the bathroom where she turned the shower on full blast. By six o'clock, she was in bed listening to uh, Bonnie Raitt uh, through the headphones plugged into her iPhone and dividing a sheet of notebook paper into neat columns. Dina gnawed on her pencil, adding up her money for the umpteenth time. How long could she make $1,482.34 last? If she checked into a cheap hotel, how long would she have before she'd exhausted her last dollar? The calculator on her phone told her two weeks, maybe a month if she lived on rice and oatmeal. She checked her email for the 10th time that day. Still no message from her husband, mberman18 at yahoo.com. Martin was still in Italy and incommunicado or he didn't care that she was within days of being homeless. She fished through the freezer for a box of burritos and stuck the last one in the microwave with the realization that she could no longer take food for granted. The phone rang and for a wonderful split second, she thought it might be Martin, but the caller ID was a number she didn't recognize. You called about my apartment. It was a male voice that sounded more New Jersey than Southwestern Florida, a fellow transplant. I, I've called about several units. Could you refresh my memory? Dina was reaching for her notebook and a pen. It's a two bedroom on Prospect, west of Trail. Great location, really nice. Used to be a guest house. A two bedroom west of the trail. West of Trail meant west of Tamiami Trail and only a block or two from the bay prime property and mucho dinero. How much are you asking? 
500 plus utilities. That's pretty reasonable. In fact, it was incredible. Had her luck suddenly changed? It's just for you, right? Yep, just me. Well, maybe we can work something out. You wanna see it? I'll be there tomorrow, 10 in the morning. Sure, I'll be there at 10 sharp. Dina wrote down the address. A two bedroom west of trail for $500? Was that even possible? She could swing it if he asked, if he'd asked for a security deposit and if she found work before the end of the month. Dina woke at four in the morning with a bad case of night terrors. Her heart was pounding in a fragment of a dream about trying to scale a moonscape of endless rocks that glowed green with toxic light followed her into wakefulness. The dream vanished as soon as she switched on the bedside light, but she couldn't quite catch her breath and her skin felt cold and clammy. She turned on the iPhone charging beside her bed and checked her email and Facebook accounts. Messages from her old life appeared like light from distant stars. The Cleveland Orchestra hoped she'd consider subscribing for the upcoming season. William Sonoma was having a sale. The North Union Farmers Market was hosting a benefit for the Hunger Center and a librarian she used to work with had posted photos of her new grandbaby. Dina liked the grandbaby then switched off the screen. She got out of bed and stood out on the lanai in her nightgown. It must have rained while she was asleep. Water was still dripping off the eaves. The night air was warm and humid, scented, scented with citrus, eucalyptus, and decaying wood with undertones of gasoline and asphalt. Across the street, a palm swayed slightly in the breeze blowing off the bay. In the distance, she could just make out a pink neon light blinking on and off downtown. It was an alien landscape, but not without its charms. If she was going to survive in this new place, she'd have to forget daffodils, autumn leaves, and winter boots, and embrace tropical delights, reimagine her predicament as an adventure, a chance for a fresh start. The sun was pouring through her bedroom window the next time she woke up. The night terrors were gone, and she felt optimistic that the guest house on Prospect might be the one. It was already nine o'clock, but Prospect was only a short walk away. She put on her best slacks, a fresh white blouse, low heeled pumps, and the gold stud earrings Martin had given her for their 15th anniversary. She licked out the last drop from a container of strawberry yogurt, then set out in better, better spirits than she'd experienced in quite a while. The walk was a little longer than she'd expected, but the morning was beautiful and she moved at a good clip first past the tiny bungalows and corner shops that hadn't yet succumbed to gentrification, then across Mound and onto Orange, where large houses stood protected behind fe fences of stucco and wrought iron. Between the houses, Dina caught a glimpse of Sarasota Bay laughing at the back of the manicured yards. She turned at Prospect and began checking the numbers on the houses she walked past. The address in her hand couldn't be right. She checked it again and then a third time before accepting that she'd arrived at her destination. An enormous Italianate structure set behind an imposing wall of weathered stone. Dina felt intimidated. The place was a mansion. But she squared her shoulders, climbed the steps onto a portico supported by huge Corinthian columns and rang the bell. Several minutes went by with no answer, so she rang again checked her watch, then looked around in confusion. No one's home. I should have told you to come round back. They only use the place in the winter. A short stubby man with oily black hair approached on a paved walk that led to the backyard. Follow me, it's in the back. I got it all opened up for you. She couldn't gauge his age, probably 40 something, but he might've been older or younger. His t-shirt had deep sweat stains under the armpits. Dina eyed him warily. Are you the rental agent? Do I look like a rental agent? It's a sublet. I can't afford the place anymore, so I gotta let it go. 
It's real nice and cheap for the neighborhood. You're gonna love it. He turned and headed back the way he'd come. Dina hesitated a moment and followed him around the corner to where a pink stucco bungalow surrounded by flowering bougainvillea sat at the rear of a spacious lot. It had its own small porch supported by white columns, replica of the ones on the main house and a large picture window with a view of the garden. There was no way in God's green earth this place rented for $500 a month. The man was standing on the porch holding the front door open. Come on, I've got another lady coming at 11. You wanna see it or don't you? What the hell, Dina thought to herself. I might as well take a look. As soon as she stepped inside, her nose was accosted by the smell of garbage. The living room was strewn with pizza boxes, beer bottles, and dirty clothes. Giant flies buzzed at the windows. A tire and an old bicycle pump were leaning incongruously against a white leather sofa. A flat screen TV sat on the floor. Damaged plaster and loose wires dangled from the wall where it had previously been installed. I'm taking the TV with me. The rest of the stuff stays. 500 bucks and it's yours. I can be out of here by tomorrow. You want to look around? Dina took a step backwards toward the door. No, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have bothered you. It's lovely, but uh, it's out of my price range. The man bolted to the front door as she turned to leave. He leaned against it, blocking her way. His expression was still affable, but a chill ran down Dina's spine. She noticed the doorknob and lock disassembled on the floor by his feet. Tell you what, I really need to get out of here. So how about 450? Have we got a deal? Dina tried to smile pleasantly. Well, that is a great offer, but there are a couple more places I want to look at first. How about if I give you a call in the morning? Hey, you ain't even seen the place yet. You want to see the bedroom? It's got a king size bed and its own bathroom. No. No, thank you. I want to go now. Dina tried to move past him toward the open door. The man didn't move. He just stared at her. She could feel him sizing her up. Tell you what, I'm going to need a deposit to hold this place until tomorrow. How much you got on you? I don't want the house. I just want to go. Will you please let me out the door? Dina's legs had gone wobbly and there was a tremor in her voice. She tried smiling again, but her face had frozen. A large hand suddenly reached out and snatched her shoulder bag with such force that she was thrown off balance. She stumbled forward, falling against the man's chest. He leered at her as she righted herself and stepped away from him. He opened her purse and pawed through it, scrambling her lipstick, blush, keys, a pen, a wad of Kleenex. He was playing with her. She held her breath, afraid to make a sound. He found her cell phone, examined it, and nodded approvingly before sticking it in his pocket. At last, he pulled out her wallet and quickly and efficiently relieved it of her debit card and all her cash, about $115, before handing the purse back to her. That should hold the house until tomorrow. You just give me a call when you've made up your mind. Then he miraculously stepped aside and let her flee across the lawn and back to the street where she retraced her steps without slowing down or looking back until she reached Andor's apartment where she raced up the steps, locked the door and sat panting at the kitchen table for several minutes before bursting into tears. And I think that is as much as I will read today. Thank you. Okay. (laughs) Thank you very much. And I love the way you use the setting and sensory details and suspense built. That that should be a hook if anyone has not read the book. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, a few announcements and then we'll get to our second feeder. Just some reminders about uh, the literary arts at Chautauqua. Uh, This is an unusual week in that the CLSC author of the week has already appeared. She was Tuesday morning's lecturer at the 1030 lecture, uh, and she spoke about climate change and her latest book, Under a White Sky, The Nature 
of the future. This was Elizabeth Colbert. Um, it was a great lecture. And the thing that's different this year is you can still catch it. If you go on the Chautauqua Assembly platform, you can watch a recording of the lecture. Tomorrow at 1215 on the virtual porch, prose writer of the week, Zelda Lockhart will be speaking on naming and repurposing your creative saboteurs. I believe that has to do with taking the very thing that very often keeps you from writing uh, to get you writing. Her talk, as well as those of other writers in residence, will also be available in recorded form on the virtual porch platform. So you can hear um, Danielle Lupa Georges' uh, speech on translation from earlier this week, if you missed it. I did just want to put in a plug for our sister literary art, the Chautauqua Theater Company. Um, they have been performing uh, Dominique Morisot's powerful play, Blood at the Root. Uh, title is taken from the Billie Holiday song, Strange Fruit. And they will resume um, some performances after the opera gets its turn at the performance pavilion. Let us turn to our second author. I'm going to read a personal statement from Estelle Rausch. I am a retired psychotherapist and adjunct professor teaching courses in diagnosis and therapy models, and originally a nonfiction writer in my profession. Beginning in 2001, following my intense professional work with family members who lost loved ones and with first responders who worked that awful 9-11 assault, I began writing fiction and attending a writer's workshop. Though Sally's Dreams, the title of her novel, has no relation to that catastrophe, it was eventually born of my increased investment in writing fiction. Let's give a welcome to Estelle, who will be reading for us. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I wanted just to let um, the audience know that Sally's Dream was actually my second uh, fiction. I published, um, had published Failure to Thrive, um, which is also a psychologically based novel, big surprise. And then it was Sally's, fiction, uh, Sally's Dream and my last novel was Trapped. And um, they will all be available in the bookstore and are available on Amazon as well. So thank you. I am going to read the first part of the first chapter of Sally's dream so I can orient you to her and her family a little bit and then skip to chapter eight um, to a, um, a kind of a crisis um, that follows a current crisis. Okay. It was a gloomy day, cold and windy, a precursor of the snow that would come that night. The Barnard Senior, standing on a crowded subway to Penn Station to catch a Long Island Railroad train for Thanksgiving weekend with her parents, was forced to backtrack. She had left her overnight bag at the apartment. During her wait for the next train, an amused Sally could imagine mom's overreaction to the young woman's delay. Sally's brother newly returned with his family to Long Island following seven years in Ohio, met her at the Glen Cove Long Island Railroad Station. To her surprise, he drove them to a park overlooking Long Island Sound. Commenting, let's catch up baby sister, he rejected her response. Mom will kill us both and it's freezing. They both admired um, the haze and clouds touched by hint of sun moving across the winter sky. A full hour later, he dropped Sally off at their parents' home. After exiting his car, supposedly to buy cigarettes, a, Sally, a smiling Sally said, 
Mom always lets you get away with murder. She'll rip me a new one. The family's large Victorian home sits majestically on a hill overlooking Long Island Sound and seems to the eye welcoming. The home's front door remains open to receive guests. Duchess, the family's beloved Samoyed, for those of you who don't know, that's a great dog, fresh from her own early Thanksgiving feast, flew towards Sally, wagging her tail wildly. Hugging her, Sally postponed an inevitable meeting with either parent while inhaling delectable odors emanating from the kitchen. In the long entrance foyer, she admired paintings and sculptures that are her mother's pride and joy. Hearing a din of familiar voices, she ventured into the great room while whispering to Duchess, mom knows I'm here, but she's punishing me by not leaving her kitchen. Yeah. Several of her parents' closest friends stand in, the, in front of a warming brick fireplace, devouring hors d'oeuvres and sipping champagne. They greet Sally with words of, and hugs. The hosts are occupied elsewhere. Mom, busy in the kitchen, finally emerges momentarily to greet her daughter. Dad, having stationed himself in his den watching college football with a few of his buddies, barely takes his eyes off the television, nods in response to her greeting. His showing so little interest in her hurts. Most male guests had joined him, though some still wandered around the women unsure of where they belonged. After their hostess calls guests to table, Rhoda Marcus is observed whispering to her husband, Sam, likely pleading with him to join everyone. Experienced at ignoring her, he responds at halftime. I'm jumping to chapter eight. A lot happened. Sally not only graduated from Columbia, she is a, a freshman at um, Stanford Law School, and she now knows her father has vanished. Nobody knows where he is, and he hasn't told anyone he was leaving. He took retirement the first moment he could. So this is a very special event in her life. Back on campus before classes resumed, I found the courage to call Betty Rand, who was her father's mistress. She answered on the first ring, responding to my announcement. I'm Sam Marcus's daughter, Sally. Hello, I've heard so much about you, but never expected to hear from you. What can I do for you? You can tell me where my father is. Does he live with you? I haven't heard a word from Sam in two years. We were good friends for almost 10 years. So I was troubled when he stopped keeping in touch without any notice either. But then I got to thinking he decided against leaving his wife, your mother. Did he tell you he was planning to leave her? That he'd be with you? Yes to the first, no to the second. Sam spoke about his unhappy marriage and for years told me he'd, love, he'd leave once you finished high school, but you know, that didn't happen. For sure, he never promised to marry me or even to live with me. What he did say is when he retired, we traveled together. And you know, that's how, well, that's how the family found out about me. When we traveled to Toronto, which was my idea, not his, and we ended up meeting his family skipping the rest of that time in the house with his former mistress, Sally booked the train from Chicago airport to this in this dreary, cold, snowy, mid-January Friday. The tightness in my chest had persisted during the flight from San Francisco to Chicago, but it had dissipated 
what was left was a kind of numbness. Why go? The train ride offered a welcome dullness, which was temporarily interrupted by two Argentinian girls anxious for information. They spoke little English, but I was able to use my marginal high school Spanish to communicate to some effect. Yes, I'm going to skip again, yes. In the late afternoon on the train heading back to Chicago, the few people sitting near me are peering out at the heavy, rapidly accumulating snow. Nervous after my visit with Betty, I welcome the mind-numbing train journey before seeing John again. John is her boyfriend. I can't help but notice an elderly gentleman accompanied by who appears to be his attentive adult daughter and two 30-something men with expensive briefcases staring at their iPhones, chatting briefly in between calls. Yes, but it's a mother with two young daughters who hold my attention. The eight year or nine year old impatient child raises her voice. How long is this train trip anyway? Why, how come we couldn't fly? Why didn't daddy come with us? Shifting my gaze from out of the foggy window, I experience a phys physiological change affecting my arms, my chest, my legs. I'm frozen in that stifling train shivering in spite of my down jacket, mittens, and woolen hat, and I'm exhausted. I somehow become that eight-year-old with my mother on that original train trip. She's whispering, though no one is anywhere near us on the train. She tells me we are going to Boston. Daddy had driven up there the previous summer when we headed for Martha's Vineyard. This is a different trip. It's winter and I don't wanna hear what mommy is saying, but she repeats her words. She can't do this to me, to us. She is angry and tells me we're going to see a bad woman who wants to take daddy away from us. I asked her if the woman will be mean, but she ignores me. Keeps talking now in a loud whisper so I don't have to strain to hear her. She says, daddy did a very bad thing. I won't take it anymore. If he doesn't get his act together, he'll never see you again. Now I'm crying and mommy apologizes. I shouldn't have said that. It's just that I'm so upset. I don't know what I'm saying. I ask her, was I bad mommy? Is that why he won't see me? Won't he come home after his business trip? Mommy says she doesn't know if he's coming home. How can that be? He always comes home and he brings gifts for grandma, for her, for me. Yeah, yeah. So daddy will come home, won't he? Now she's quiet and says we're to read our books. She had bought me a Judy Bloom novel. Then we're off the train and at the station we eat hot dogs. Yeah, with mustard and sauerkraut. Mommy drinks coffee and buys me orange juice. Afterward, we get out where it's even colder than New York. There's snow on the ground. We get a cab right away. Mommy tells me to be quiet because I keep asking her where we're going. She says to meet daddy's girlfriend. She says her name, Vicky. Mommy looks so mad. I'm scared of her. Soon the cab stops in front of a brownstone on Commonwealth Avenue and we get out with mommy telling the driver to wait with the meter running. An old lady lets us in without our ringing the doorbell. It's Saturday, so mommy says she's sure Vicky will be home. A pretty tall lady wearing a BU sweatshirt and jeans answers her door. At first she seems nice, but when mommy pushes her way into the apartment and says her name, Vicky tells us to leave. Get out or I'll call the police. You have some nerve coming here and threatening me. What do you want? Mommy is shouting now. I want you to leave my husband alone. This is my little girl. She's only eight years old. She needs her father. Now mommy is crying and screaming at the same time. 
Vicky gets right up close to mommy's face and screams back, get out of here, now. She tries pushing mommy out the door. I beg mommy, can I go to the bathroom? I gotta go mommy, please, please. Ignored, I wet my pants. The pee goes on the lady's wood floor and even on the corner of a pretty rug. No one pays attention to me. So it all comes out and I'm soaking wet, crying. Let's go, mommy, please. We get into the waiting taxi. I'm scared to wet the man's seat. Whisper that to mommy. At first, she doesn't seem to even hear me. Finally, she says, we'll buy you a new sweatshirt. We'll buy you new pants um, before the train. I'm not thinking anymore about mommy and that lady, just about my wet pants and what the driver might, uh, might think and notice that I smell. Mommy says we're to never talk about this ever, ever. It's our secret. We do go to Filene's where I get an entire new snowsuit snow and underwear. Then surprising me, we enter the toy department where mommy buys me a baby doll and a large bear. And then we have a lovely lunch together. Yeah. Sally returns to the present with difficulty. I managed to rise pressured by actually having to pee, then stumble clumsily past the few seated preoccupied passengers to enter what is a smelly Amtrak's bathroom way at the far end of the train car. Tears up until then contained traveled down my cheeks. I remained in the bathroom until multiple knocks forced my exit. Thinking back to my recent perusal of my diary, I wonder why I never spoke of the traumatic meeting with daddy's then girlfriend or even wrote about it in my diary as, as an adolescent, but I know the answer. I kept my mother's terrible secret even from myself, no matter the ultimate damage to me. That eight-year-old child hadn't consciously decided to protect her mother, but she may have understood that mother was ashamed, which was why she had asked her daughter to keep the secret. How weird that I think of that child I was as she, not me. Yes, it's as if there was a split in me between the before and the after of that trip. How to gain, get past the insidious distrust I have for my mother, for my father, for almost anyone who tries to get close to me. That frightened though invaded, that frightening thought invaded my being, not for the first time, during the taxi ride to Jonas. Thank you. You can unmute. Unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Estelle. Um, certainly a wide ranging in time and space and psychology uh, reading. Now we have a little time if anyone would like you to make comments or ask questions. I believe we can take the informal route and just raise your hand and unmute if you have a question or a comment. Sabiha. Yes, uh, thank you so much for both of you. Uh, but starting with Patricia, I, uh, you painted a picture of the house that was so vivid, uh, the way you described uh, the house in Shaker Heights. And then as she's waiting for an email from her ex-husband, it's almost like you feel like there's a countdown. And I was holding my breath, is she gonna hear from him? And knowing that she's most likely not gonna hear from him, but still you had me as a reader or as a listener hold my breath towards that uh, countdown. And then she gets this phone call and it's mysterious. And yet uh, a reader knows that there's, you know, this is a con man. However, I found myself forgiving her for her 
inability to see that she was being conned because she was so desperate. And so you go along with her. And when she goes over there, just taking one look at him, the way you described him, I, the reader, knew that he was definitely more than just a con man. And she realizes in time, in time that he is out to get her, but, but it's a bit too late for her. And throughout that time, I held my breath and you just, you just had me in a grip, like, is she gonna be able to escape? Is he gonna rob her? And uh, it, it was just a very, very gripping. It was like a thriller. <laughs> Thank you for going on that journey with me. Yeah, That's yeah. So I mean, I'm saying, done. how could she not know? Yeah. And yet when you're desperate, you know, you you, you are in a semi-denial phase and you, you know, you, you, you let yourself uh, get swayed and that came through very well. Thank you. And then I had a comment for Estelle. Can I continue? Yes. Okay. Uh, Estelle, this was very, very sad, very, uh, very it, it, it just broke my heart. And I am angry at the mother. Why is she putting her daughter in this situation? Why is she traumatizing her? It's like abuse of her child and, uh, you know, to, to drag her through this and uh, then expect her to keep this to herself to protect the mother. And at no time is she thinking about her daughter. So her selfishness, you know, comes through. You didn't call her selfish, you didn't have to, but the way you described how she acts and how she, you know, her dialogue, it, it comes clearly through that she's obsessed and she's only thinking about herself and venting her anger and not thinking about what she is putting her child to. And I think you wrapped it up very well in the end when she is now an adult is trying to reconcile. You know, this, this episode prompts her to remember what it was like to be an eight year old. And she tries to reconcile her past with her present and forgive her mother. Thank Very you. moving. Thank you. Mm. Oh, I love the smelly bathroom on Amtrak because I can relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yeah can i relate to that yeah. i was wondering when i wrote it of course as a new yorker by the way and it's obvious to everybody although yeah. i live in naples florida i'm certainly still in new yorker um whether people um who live in cleveland or wherever will recognize uh, the names i lived in boston also so commonwealth Ave, you know and well, I took the train from Chautauqua, well, from Buffalo to New York at one time. And that was when I said, never again. <laughs> it was like the smelly bathroom. Was, oh. oh, yeah, they're horrible. <laughs> I you got go. me on that. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question for Pat. Uh, Pat, um, you started out as a poet, I think. And so, I, and I'm wondering, um, Poetry is such a scaled down version of such a dis distillation of thought into the fewest possible words. How and where you find enough words to make a novel? <laughs> Good question. I was quite sure I couldn't do it. Um, I uh, never intended really to write a novel. It was something that I imagined was totally beyond me. I, I wrote little things, <laughs> but um, a, a woman who's a writer and publisher who I met online actually in an online writing group uh, told me uh, that uh, the short piece that I had written was really the beginning of a novel and I should write the whole novel. And I told her, nope, can't do it. <laughs> I write poetry. I just, <laughs> I don't have that many words in me. Yeah, uh, but she said, "Nope, nope, you're going to write a novel," and uh, with the help of that writers group, it's a, a small group of people who I've been working with now for about seven years. Uh, I've written three novels. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's really serendipity. Had you not joined that uh, writing group, maybe you would never have attempted a novel. No, I would have probably written uh, some short stories. I was doing a little prose, but um, 
I probably would never have crossed over onto the into the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> so I still love poetry, and uh, I actually I hope to get back to it when once I'm really finished finished uh, mm -hmm. launching this next novel. I'd like to start writing more poetry again. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, any other questions or comments? Well, in that case, let's give a final round of applause and uh, expression of gratitude to Pat and Estelle. Thank you for hosting, Fred. Uh, yes, you're welcome. Thank you. Yes. And you're welcome. Thank you. That's Fred. a big job you take on. Yes. Oh, yes. I know it's yes. only yes. one of okay. many big jobs you do for the Writers' Center. Oh, yes. thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. That, that was a paid political announcement. Thank you, Pat. Okay. <laughs> um, I do thank want you. to remind you up. that next week at this time, we'll have two poets reading. Um, Craig Seif will be reading from his book, Lovely Drags, and Carol Townsend will be reading, is it gonna be mostly from The Color of Shadows? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. from her most recent book. Uh, I also want to urge you to consider joining the Friends if you're not already a member. I put the, uh, the link on chat. Also wanna remind you that once I stop recording, and the session ends as quickly as possible. I'll be posting it on the Friends of the Chautauqua Writers Center YouTube channel. So you can direct people who miss this or you yourself can watch it again if you want to relive this experience. Okay. Anyway, thank you, thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Take bye. care. Bye-bye.